I want winners. I want people that want to win. You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. You got to put your money where your mouth is, Pete. It's not gambling advice. We await a Bob Nightingale tweet letting us know if we have a season or not. Colby Olson and I are ranking the top 30 fantasy second baseman. Welcome to Not Gambling Advice Wednesday, March 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. Colby Olson, how you doing, bro? How's the lockout um, continue to treat you into the night? Um, well, the news we've been getting like the last 10, 15 minutes does not look good. Does not look like a deal is going to get done tonight. Um, unfortunately, but things change, right? Yesterday, we didn't think a deal was going to get done. And then, you know, 10 30 PM hits and, and things kicked into to a fifth gear. So let's just hope that happens, but we'll see. We'll see. We are not on the ground floor there, but what we are on the ground floor of is bringing you the best fantasy advice there is. So would love to get into the second base rankings. Let's just get into the second base rankings. Currently we're recording at around 3 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And Jesse Rogers of ESPN, if I'm not mistaken, came out and said that a final deal will need to be agreed upon by 5 p.m. Eastern. But... I don't know why it has to be 5 p.m. Eastern because they set their own deadline. They set it for midnight on the 28th, and now it's 5 p.m. I just don't understand what they're doing, but what we do understand is fantasy baseball, and we know that we're going to have a season. Regardless of how many games, we got to rank these fantasy second basemen. So on today's episode, you will hear 30 to 11, or actually it's 35 to 11, and then on Friday, you're going to hear us rank 10 to 1. So let's start it off with a bang, kind of. With number 35, Adam Frazier. Number 34, Joey Wendell. Number 33, Luis Arias. Number 32, Cesar Hernandez. 31, Jose Miranda. Number 29, Nick Solak. Number 28, Josh Rojas. Number 27, Gavin Lux. 26, Jonathan Scope. 25, Colton Wong. 24, Garrett Hampson. Number 23, Kike Hernandez. 22, Eduardo Escobar. 20... Two, Jeff McNeil, and 21, Gene Segura of the Philadelphia Phillies. So, a lot of names I just threw at you. We're obviously going to give 20 to 11 a, a little bit more shine, but who out of that range excites you? I actually think there's a few guys here that, that really excite me, and, and one guy that I think I'm going to stay away from, but but just to get into it, Jose Miranda, you mentioned, is is one of my favorites here. He's being drafted... ADP 433. So he's really not even being drafted unless you're in a super, super deep league. He's probably going to be a guy that's on your waiver wire. And like he's in the minors still. He will come up. I'm assuming after Super 2, most projection systems have him between 400 and 500 plate appearances. But let's face it, this guy immediately when he comes up is going to be a top 20 second baseman. And you should put him at the top of your watch list. I mean, his numbers are insanity, Peter. 343. 30 home runs and a 960 OPS between 591 plate appearances in double A and triple A last year. Those are like video game numbers. And I don't think he's going to come up and hit 343 in the major leagues. But if he's hitting 290 to 300 with 30 home run power, you're getting like a Luis Arias level, like batted ball profile. Plus, like, you know, he, he walks and does not strike out, but he has the power that Luis Arias does not have. It's kind of an enticing player, and, and we've talked about all these rookies, and it's so hard to project how many at-bats they're going to get. But if you can get 400 to 500 at-bats, that's a guy maybe you draft at the end. Maybe you didn't draft a great second baseman, but you want some upside. He's a phenomenal player to stash on your bench. Another guy that I really like that's being drafted really late in drafts, past the 300 mark, around 312 currently, is Jeff McNeil. I mean, Jeff McNeil is not that bad. We saw him hit at least 311 in each of his first three seasons before him hitting 252 in 2021. And he had 23 home runs in 2019 versus just seven in 2021. I think we saw a Mets offense that, I and mean, we've talked about it on previous episodes, that 
all of them just had really down years from Francisco Lindor to Tom Smith to a bunch of other guys on their roster. I think that's what he suffered. I don't think Jeff McNeil is a 250 hitter. I think he's a 300 hitter. And I think we could see between 15 to 20 home runs and that would launch him right back in to the top 20. And he's currently being drafted as the 33rd second baseman off the board. We currently have him at number 22. I think that's where he ranks. And I think he has the possibility of getting back into the top 20 if he so chooses. If I told you that the man who led baseball in batting average with a 319 batting average from 2018 to 2020 ahead of Mookie Betts yes. is being drafted, not even being drafted in some spots, like 33rd best second baseman, insane. He hit 252 last year, but I think we all know that's not Jeff McNeil. I think he was, you know, the Mets offense was stagnant. He was probably battling some injuries, some lower body injuries, and I think an off season to get healthy, he might not hit 300, but if he's 280 to 290 again, he's money. He's money at the value he's at right now. He's money. And I do like the Mets offense a little bit better from the guys. Some of the added, you know, Mark Canna and Starling Marte. I think overall they're going to have a better offense with a Francisco Lindor bounce back that I think we're all assuming is going to happen. I think the runs and the RBIs could tick up as well. And I just think Jeff McNeil, you know, if he's going way late in drafts and, and you're not confident in your second base role, I think he could be a starter for you by the end of the year. I really do. And even in a 10 team, 12 team league, I think he could be a possible starter, maybe in that second base slash shortstop role. But I wouldn't be shocked if he's if he's up there. Also, another player that I wanted to quickly mention, Gavin Lux is so interesting to me because Gavin Lux was a t- tippity top prospect, not just a top prospect in the Dodgers system, top 10. but the number like, two top 10 prospect over- in baseball he was the number two overall prospect yeah. in baseball at one point. Like this guy has crazy potential, but I don't know if he's actually that good. That's the problem. But I think potential wise, easy top 20 guy, but what we could also see is him not even in the top 30 at all. So when you look at Gavin Lux, what do you think? So he he's a guy that I'm staying away from right now. ADP is is around 220 to 230 right now. I'd way rather have Jeff McNeil. And I I I personally just don't understand the hype. I think the hype is that he was a former top prospect. People are just not even going to look at his numbers and just go, right, he was a number two prospect in baseball. He must be good. I Dodgers. I just don't understand the hype, especially from a fantasy perspective. He hit 250 last year. The power didn't shine through. He had a 120 ISO, which is like bottom quarter percentile, like not not a good ISO at all. The power just is not there. I just don't see the upside here. What is the upside for for Gavin Lux this year? Is it 250 with 15 to 18 bombs and like he's going to be hitting at the back end of a Dodgers lineup? Like, I don't know. That doesn't seem too exciting to me. I agree, but the profile coming out was 275 with 20, 20, like 20 home runs, 20 steals. And, you know, he's in a Dodgers lineup where he can drive in runs. That sounds like a top 10 for second base, maybe yeah. even top five. But yeah. we're just not going to get see that. The power. And I, don't, I don't see the power either. Yeah. I really don't. And to me, how many opportunities are they even going to give him with yeah, re-signing yeah. Chris Taylor? And, you know, if they if they sign Freddie Freeman... Max Muncy, I know, has been dealing with the elbow thing, but he's going to move around a little bit. Where does Gavin Lux even get to play? Agreed. Agreed. I mean, even if Gavin Lux does get 600 plate appearances, I don't I don't see the hype. I'd much rather have a guy like Garrett Hampson, who I know is at least going to give me 20 steals, close to 20 steals. I'm not getting that from Lux. I don't think and you are either. Hampson's not going to give you the power either, but neither is Lux. I'm, I'm staying far, far away from Gavin Lux, and I love that you are too. I, I think it's a no-brainer that you should stay away from him. Um, Another guy that that I think is interesting is Eduardo Escobar, who's in that Mets lineup as well. They signed him to a two year, $20 million deal. Um, last year, he hit really well. He had 253 with 28 bombs, 77 runs, 90 RBIs and in, in 600 plate appearances. And that's coming off of a 2019 that had him hit 35 home runs in 700 plate appearances. And I don't think he's going to get 700 plate appearances again in that in that Mets Mets lineup because let's face it, the Mets have a ton of bats. They have a ton of bats. I mean, like JD Davis is going to be vying for plate appearances. Mark Vientos might even come up and be vying for plate appearances. You never know, or even Brett Beatty. So it's it's a mash together Mets lineup. But if Eduardo Escobar does get 600 plate appearances again, he hits the ball in the air a ton. I think you're kind of locking in um, another season about what he did 245 with with close to 30 home runs and 
like you said, the Mets lineup's pretty deep. He could probably probably do pretty much what he did last year. I think he's a good value there at like the back end of that that 200. It's like 200 ADP. Especially, I, I agree with your point. And you're getting him, you're getting all of his home runs at a position that isn't very power heavy. So I like that, especially if you're going later in the rounds, you don't see that many home runs on your roster. He could be a guy that you scoop up, put him in a utility role, put him in a second base slash short sub role, and he can get you some of those home runs that maybe you missed earlier in your drafts. So let's start with number 20, Luis Arias of the Milwaukee Brewers. We've talked about him before. I'm a big fan of Luis Arias, both in fantasy baseball and in real life. He qualifies at second base, shortstop, and third base, and has real pop in his bat. He's still just 24 years old, coming off a season where he hit 250 with 23 bombs and over 75 runs and RBIs, and he even swiped five bags. But Arias is not going to help you much in the batting average department, but I think that we should con- expect the power to continue even if it's not that much higher because his hard hit rate was around major league average last year and he's still just five foot nine and 168 pounds but he's drafted he's being drafted as the number 18th second baseman off the board and i just think he's a solid selection late in drafts at the position where we said not a lot of power at this position he can provide that the only problem is how much more power is he going to give you than 23 home runs is that the peak what do you think yeah, I think it's pretty much spot on. I mean, he he has that triple position eligibility, second base, shortstop, third base, which is enticing. And I think you're right. I mean, he hits the ball in the air a lot, about 60% of the time between line drive and fly ball percentage. And yeah, he had 23 home runs last year. I could see 25 home runs this year. Easy. I could too. I think you can pretty much lock him in for that. I don't think he's going to give you a, a high average either. Um, but this is a guy that, that yeah, he's, he's locked in in that Brewers lineup in like the six hole and, and their lineup isn't the best, but it isn't, isn't bad by any measure. Um, so yeah, not I, great, I like him. I like him here. Not great though. That's the problem. I mean, last year they were pretty not good. You know, losing Abisail Garcia certainly doesn't help adding Hunter Renfro does even losing Jackie Bradley jr. Is Do you think they're going to bounce back though? I think that that Brewers lineup is going <laughs> to bounce back. I think Yelich could have a bounce back. Willie Adamas raked in the second half once he got there last year. But remember um, get, no Escobar get, anymore. No 20. No. So, the, so they have some, but he was traded in season. True, true. I'm just saying in general, when you look at the full scope of the Brewers over the... And no Avisel Garcia anymore. Yeah, so like, yeah, exactly. Um, so but the, you're right. they're just, they're okay. And like, I, I'm expecting Keston Hura to bounce back a little bit. But besides that, I, I got to be quite honest with you, because I think we're all hoping that Yelich has bounced yeah, back. Yeah. But yeah. Yelich has shown no signs that he's going to do that. We just believe it because we know how talented he is. But he hasn't shown signs of bouncing back. So I, I that's why Luis Arias might be 20th on our rankings because I don't see a ton of runs. I don't sure. see a ton of RBIs. Exactly. And you're really just relying on the power because he's not going to steal you that many bags. But you're relying on a guy with a 46% hard hit rate who was five foot nine at 168 pounds. I it's mean, great that he plays in the band box in Milwaukee. Yeah. But I just... And I like his positional versatility, but personally, I'm a bigger fan of Luis Arias as a player rather than a fancy player. And let's be real here, Peter, right? Like Gene Segura, who I have 20, who we have 21st is 199 ADP compared to Luis Arias, who is 155. Gene Segura is like the lock of locks to hit 290 with 15 right. bombs. Like the we say all the lineup, time. I think what we be say better. all the time about Gene Segura. He's, I you don't know, know what you say. He just hits. He's he one of those hits. guys. He, he just hits. He just hits. hits. <laughs> he, I would much rather have him you later know, four draft. rounds later than, yeah. than you, Luis Rice. And I think this gets us into this number 19 guy who is actually being drafted behind Luis Rice as well. It's Brendan Rogers of um, the Colorado Rockies. This is another guy that like Gavin Lux is a former top prospect. And you might've forgot that because he's been a top prospect since 2015 and is cool just now, like literally last year was the first year that he had more than 400 plate appearances this is going to be his first real test. So last year in the second half, after he kind of, you know, got a chance to see MLB pitching, he really came into his own. He hit 296 with 10 bombs, 37 runs, and 31 RBIs. Let's extrapolate that to a full season. If he hits close to 300 with like 23 home runs, you know, 80 runs, maybe 65 RBIs, and like the Rockies don't have anybody. Brendan Rodgers is going to hit in the two hole three hole or four hole. Like he's going to be right there in the middle of that lineup. He's going to have plenty of opportunities to at least like pad the stats a little bit. 
And say what you want about the Colorado Rockies, they have had a decent track record of developing shortstops. From Troy Tulowitzki, now to Trevor Story, now to potentially Brendan Rodgers. And they really need to test Brendan Rodgers, right? He was their top draft pick. They need to find out what they have with him. So I agree with you. I think he's going to get a ton of playing time. And for sure, being in Colorado certainly helps. So let's talk about his teammate, Ryan McMahon of the Colorado Rockies, of course. He's known as a glove first guy, finishing 97th percentile and outs above average he's got a crazy glove but he can also swing it a little bit and the Coors effect is definitely going to help his standard stats he's coming off a season where he hit 254 with 23 bombs and 80 plus rbis and runs and add in six stolen bases he also hit 32 doubles which was top 20 in the national league last year his hard hit rates and exit velocities are pretty solid 68th percentiles are better and he seems to check most of the five categories He's currently being drafted as the 20th best second baseman, but we have him a bit higher in our rankings, but there is something to monitor. He did struggle and he has struggled against left-handed pitching in his career so far. So maybe, you know, a lefty's on the mound. Maybe you might have to take him out of your lineup, but overall, I think this is a really solid player who, again, is probably a better actual player than a fantasy player, but still a solid option because he can kind of do everything. Yeah, I agree, Pete. I, I think the interesting thing here is is McMahon and Brennan Rogers are on the same team, but from a fantasy perspective, they're like they're valued the same, but they're very different fantasy players. Rogers is going to get you higher average, close to three hundred, with a ton of runs. McMahon's going to be more around two fifty to two sixty, with about the same power upside. He'll probably hit twenty five. He could even try to go to thirty home runs. I don't know Maybe if that's not. really possible. Yeah. It's probably around twenty five home runs, but yeah. he's going to sprinkle in some stolen bases. What do you have? Six last year. Six last year. Um, so I think like I'm not really torn on whether to pick McMahon or Rogers in a draft. I think it's just kind of dependent on the team that you're drafting and it, and what do you need? Do I need an average boost or do I need more RBIs at this stage of the draft? If I need more RBIs, I'm going with Van. If I need more average, I'm going Rogers. I think they're and you might, about the same. And you might think that, you know, how did we just name teammates at the same position? Because Brendan Rogers qualifies at shortstop as well. So that's important to know. Well, McMahon is, is their primary second baseman, but you know, Rogers is more likely going to play short a lot of well, this year. I, I think McMahon Unless plays the Rock- third mostly. Yeah, McMahon. Play. Oh, did I say, did I say, yeah, well, he can play second and third base. Yeah, he has eligibility at, at second yeah. and third as well. So they, they both have dual eligibility, which is cool. Um, but yeah, I agree, man. I think, I think McMahon's a great choice. I think now we're moving in this, this next guy kind of brings us to another tier in the second Agreed. base rankings. Um, this is going to be a, a tier above McMahon and Rogers. It, it's Chris Taylor of the Dodgers um, who just re-signed with the Dodgers last year. He had probably his best year since 2017. He hit 254 with 20 home runs, 90 runs, 73 RBIs and stole 13 bags, which was his most since 2017 when he stole 18. I don't know about you, man. I think this is just kind of what we have come to expect with Chris Taylor. Like I think you can lock him in for basically what he did last year next year right like he's gonna hit in that six to seven hole in the Dodgers lineup and like this is what you're gonna get I've had Chris Taylor on a lot of my fantasy teams just because I love what I know what I'm getting and you know me the way I draft like I like to go you know upside then safe then upside and safe and I like to fill out my draft with a lot of those guys and I always feel like Chris Taylor makes it on my team you know he can qualify for it seems like every position except catcher and pitcher (laughs) and he's just always a threat in every category I'm a big fan of Chris Taylor, and he's most likely going to be on my fantasy team again this year just because I always tend to get him because he's so safe, and I like yeah, him. Yeah, I like his current draft position, too. He, he's going 137th, 15th, second baseman off the board. We have him at 17, but like I think anyone within this tier is kind of like, who do you who do you want? Again, it's about how, how are you building your team. Like I might – it just all depends on the draft falls. Like These rankings are not end-all, be-all, right? And this is a guy we've talked about at number 16, DJ LeMahieu. But let me just start it off for, with it first. I don't think that the DJ LeMahieu that we saw in 2021 is the DJ LeMahieu that we should expect, plain and simple. Will he hit 360 like he did in 2020? Probably not. <laughs> Will he even hit the 327? Hit 360? Exactly. Will he even hit the 327 that he did in 2019? No. 
But do we think that he's going to hit 268 like he did in 2021? Absolutely not. I think it's somewhere in the middle. I think he's going to hit 300 with 15 to 20 bombs, 100 runs scored, and 75 plus RBIs. And he qualifies at first base, second base, and third base. DJ LeMay, he was a very solid option. And I don't think you should expect what we saw last year. No, absolutely not. He he's too smart of a hitter to yes. to do that as well. Like I think DJ is is one of the hardest workers on that Yankees team. I mean, he he's a guy that shows up, takes really really pride in his craft. I'm I'm expecting a bounce back too. Um, so moving on to 15, this is a guy we already talked about in our first base rankings as well. It's Ty France of the Seattle Mariners. Um, who's actually being drafted 30 spots behind DJ. And, and I, I do want to get your thoughts on that a little bit. Like, are you taking Ty France above DJ here? Like, or probably at least am. waiting, right? If you can get France. I mean, they're waiting or probably taking Ty France above DJ. I think the Seattle offense is going to be a little bit better. I think Jared Kelnick is going to have a better year than he did last year. I mean, how can you not? I think Julio Rodriguez is going to come up. I think they're going to get the services back of Kyle Lewis. I just like this Mariners offense a little bit better. And I believe in Ty France as a hitter. You know, I think Ty France is as good of a bet as anyone to hit 290. I think DJ LeMahieu is right in there too. I think Ty France has a little bit more power than DJ LeMahieu. And I don't think the runs and the RBIs are going to be that far off. You know, more than likely in this range, honestly, I normally go with Chris Taylor. Not to say that you should, that if you're drafting who you like, I still think Chris Taylor is a little bit worse than France and LeMahieu, but I'd rather wait for Chris Taylor. And I think they're all kind of in a similar tier. I think they're in, it's a tier. I think this is a tier tier right here. And I think Chris Taylor is a fine choice. And I'd rather just wait for Taylor, I think. Who would you go with? Um, Yeah, I I think I'd probably take Taylor for the steals at this point. Um, But I think it, it really all comes down to like, how did your draft before this go? Because who exactly. it's all about need in a draft. I mean, like you can't just have 40 first basemen on your team. Like that's not how it works. But I think we both agree that those three options are all solid. So let's Very solid. let's break into a new tier at number 14. And that's Jake Cronenworth with the San Diego Padres. Dude, the Crone Zone is a Swiss army knife. <laughs> He's a do-everything type player who checks all the boxes in fantasies maybe accept stolen bases, even though he did steal four last year. I mean, he finished 2021 with a 266 average with 21 bombs, 94 runs, and 71 RBIs. But he doesn't hit the ball all that hard, to be honest. He only finished in the 23rd percentile of hard hit rate, but he did have 33 doubles. He just finds a knack for finding a hole in the outfield. He's a very, very safe selection, and at his current ADP of the 14th best second baseman is right where we have him nabbed. I'm just Jake Cronenworth, really safe. You know what you're going to get in every single category except stolen bases, but he's got enough speed that maybe he could steal you five, but you know, you're getting 20 plus to 25 home runs. You're going to get a 270 batting average. You're going to get plenty of RBIs and runs. Just a really safe, good pick. I think the interesting thing with Jake Cronenworth is that 2020 was his rookie season. Last year was really his first full year that we saw. And I think, I don't know if, if it's just me, but I feel like Jake Cronenworth has been around longer than he has. He's such a high floor guy. Um, it's like these, yeah, these agree, prospects that come up agree, when agree. you just know, when you think you know what they're going to do and then they do it, you're just like, all right, well, I already know what he is rather than, oh, like maybe I have to go in and find out more. Jake Cronenworth, we just, he's one of the most high floor guys that we have in our sport. It's kind of similar to Chris Taylor. He almost seems like just a younger reincarnation of him. Yeah, you know, that Swiss Army speed, just without the steals. But I'd say but, a little bit more power. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe. But I think the interesting thing with Cronenworth is that in 2020, his hard hit rate was about 43%. Um, right. And last year, it actually went down 8% to 35%. So, like, I could see a third year kind of renaissance for, for Jake Cronenworth. Like I think he has a little bit more in the tank here. I don't think it's a lot more in the tank, but I think Cronenworth has more in the tank here. I think he could take another leap in this, in this next, in his third year and, and maybe, you know, 25 bombs, 275 and like Padres lineup will probably be really, really good again this year. I think they're going to be even better than they were last year. I think why we like him is because, 
we're very confident that he will not be a shred worse than he was in 2021. I think we only think he can get better, which is exciting because you have a really solid floor already with the possibility of some upside there with a very safe pick, which is not fine much in baseball. He's being taken 119 ADP. I would even take him above that. I think if you can get him, you know, around a hundred, I'm fine with taking Jake Cronenworth above as my ADP. Yeah. As am I. Um, so that brings us to 13. It's a guy that we've already talked about as well. Um, but I think deserves a little bit more discussion. It's, it's Max Muncy. And, you know, I, am just kind of, the, the more I thought about it, Peter, I, I'm just kind of wondering why his ADP is so low. I, I, I think it's the question mark of obviously it's the injury, the injury, think- but like, if you can get him 150th, I know. It's an absolute steal. And I think it also, it's in tune with the lockout, right? We're not hearing anything, which is so abnormal from a regular year. And when we don't hear anything, that's when, as a fantasy drafter, there's so many good players. So I think he just kind of falls in drafts because you're like, I don't want to be the guy to touch him. So I think that's the reason. But I think, you know. Let's get close to the mic here. I think we're going to go grab him because I think he's going to play. I think he's going to play, but also, like, if you have skills and you can get value, like, get another second baseman, like, say, Jeff McNeil, and then take Max Muncy. Yeah, yeah. Or you can take some upside. There's some upside here. So <laughs> I just I, – I like the Max Muncy play. I, if, you can, if you can grab him, I'd grab him – ADP 150, you say? It's just way too fucking low. I mean, he could be in the ADP 50 when healthy. I don't know about that. I don't like, know about that. he's a top 100 maybe, player. Yeah. <laughs> top 100 player, without a doubt. Like, this is a guy that, that is has 35 home runs in three straight seasons. Like, what are we doing here? And um, plenty of RBIs, too, and runs. That's why I'm like, are you sure he might be not be I think top 50 when healthy? I, I really think if you take Max Muncy, where he's currently being drafted, and it turns out that he is hurt for the year. I think you can salvage. I think you can salvage that. Like, I think the cost is worth it right now. Agreed. I think the cost is worth it too. What about number 12, Tommy Edmond of the St. Louis Cardinals? Tommy Edmond, another guy who's a better actual player than in fantasy, but he's still a really solid option on your team just because he's an incredible defender. I think it's the opposite though. I think he's a better fantasy player than he is a real life player. Let's talk about it. He's got outfield qualifications as well, which I do love. And I think he can hit for a better average than he did last year at 262. Um, He's just got great bat to ball skills and he's super fast. And he only hit 11 home runs last year. And I don't know how many more we should expect, but he was one of six players last year to steal 30 bases. That's where the value is. And you should expect 90 plus runs, but the RBIs might not go above 60. He only had 57 last year. He's another safe option with the upside to be a top 10 guy. And he's currently being drafted as the number 11 second baseman off the board. My thinking is why I like him better as a actual player than a fantasy player. And not to say I still, we still think he's the 12th best fantasy second baseman. I just think he's an easy top 10 second baseman right now in baseball. Maybe. Uh, Maybe. His, his I'm looking at the good, list. I don't know about that, dude. Not to Tommy Hedman, really? You think? I mean, for example, like we are about to get into a number 11 who I think Tommy Hedman is a better player than our number 11 guy. Maybe he might be the 11th best second baseman currently, but he's just such a phenomenal defender. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. with the lack of power, that's the only reason I have pushback on that. But I also think he's a great fantasy second baseman as well. So this is the interesting thing. I think this is where the fantasy community is kind of split on Tommy Edmond is because I think some people do believe in the power uptick for Tommy Edmond this year. I don't don't see it. I mean, the guy doesn't hit the ball hard. 33 to 35% hard hit rate. He doesn't hit the ball in the air a lot. And yeah, he's fast, but like, and that's also not his job on the Cardinals. That's not his job on the Cardinals. They have Tyler O'Neill. Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado. His job is to get on base for those guys. So like, even if he has the potential for power, he's not going to really, I don't think he's going to try to unlock it. Uh, He's not a guy who you want to risk batting average to get more power. When in the back of your lineup, you have a bunch of guys who are literally doing that. 
So Tommy Edmonds' goal is to get on base. That's why I think the stolen bases could even creep up. I don't think 30 is some fluke. I think 30 is, yeah, I think 30 is probably about like spot on for Tommy Edmonds. Okay, here's here is actually an interesting question for you. We don't really know where Trevor's story is going. I don't think anybody has a good idea of where Trevor's story is. And you can going you, to, I know what you're gonna say, but no, continue. I think it's I fun it. though. I think it's a fun theory here. Like if Trevor's story went to St. Louis links up with his brother, Nolan Arenado, on the left side of that, that infield. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but if it did, Trevor Story would probably bump Tommy Edmond out of that leadoff spot. So, like, how much of Tommy Edmond's value is entrenched in him being the number one hitter, the, the leadoff guy on a great Cardinals lineup? Because if he's booted from the, la- the leadoff spot... Pff. I think it's an interesting hypothetical. Because if that were to happen, I think his value drops a little bit. You know, and those runs, those are important. And the steals, you know. Just opportunities. Just, really just opportunity. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's a better way to describe it. I just think, you know, we spoke with Katie Wu on the Just Baseball show. And she said that the priority is starting pitching because they want to give Paul DeYoung you know, he's making 10 plus million dollars and Edmundo Sosa a better shot at okay. the shortstop position and that they have to attack the starting rotation. I know they already signed Steven Matz, but I don't know how much confidence we have in Miles Michaelis and Dakota Hudson has been good in spurts, but doesn't have a ton of major league experience. So they're going to need to invest in pitching after the lockout. Hey, hey, yeah. I think Paul DeYoung and Edmundo Sosa, the more I look into it, are fine enough. That's yeah, why yeah. I just don't think that they're going to do it. So I think we can just slot in Edmund at the leadoff spot and that he's going to provide the value that I think he will. But it is, it's an interesting conversation because yeah, yeah. of the connection with Arenado and Story. You know, they're Colorado brothers and they already have that. But I just, and it also, you know, the Cardinals don't have this large propensity to, you know, give out big contracts anyway. Um, I know they signed Goldschmidt, but you know, I, how I just don't find it likely that they go. Get, yeah, yes, that they go agree. then get Trevor Story. So. I do think I think you're right. I, I don't think they're going to get Story. I just think I like I like Tommy Edmond, and I think if you can get him after where he's going in drafts, go for it. But I don't know if I'm necessarily taking. I'm definitely not taking him over our number eleven guy. But before I get into the number eleven guy, I just think keep it in the back of your mind. What if Tommy Edmond struggles? to begin the year and they boot him from that leadoff spot. I'm just saying like a lot of his value is entrenched. In I just don't think spot. he would. I just don't think he will struggle there. And fair. also think about the rest of their lineup. Either. If they're going to kick him out of the leadoff spot, who are they going to put in? Cause you're probably not going to put in the young. You're probably not going to put in like, they just have a lot of middle of the order bats. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. You're not going to bat Tyler O'Neill lead off. Like, I mean, you could. He's so sick. <laughs> like, he's, he's so RBI fire. Getter. He's an RBI getter. Um, but yeah, so that brings us to the number 11 player, who I think is, I mean, I think we all know, is one of the most electric players in the league. This guy does things on the baseball field that are not quantifiable. It's Jazz Chisholm of the Miami Marlins. He was a rookie last season, 23 years old. What did he do in that minor league in that rookie year season? 248, 18 bombs, 70 runs, 53 RBIs, and 23 bags in only 507 plate appearances. My thing here is if you give Chaz Chisholm 600 to 650 plate appearances, I could see 25 home run, 30 stolen base potential. He hits the ball hard. He hits the ball hard. 43% of the time, 42% of the time. Um, I think with more experience, he's only going to get better. I don't think the K rate is going to be, you know, managed to go down at all. I think his K rate around 30% is kind of where he's at, but I think he's a lot like, uh, okay, I'll stop myself here. He's not a lot like Otani, but like he has that Otani like skill where when he does hit the ball, he hits it hard. Right. And I like, I mean, that's a lot of guys when they have to hit the ball, they, they hit the ball and not a lot of guys, but definitely some, and you chose Shohei Otani. I chose Shohei Otani. He's not like a shit Shohei Otani, but you get the point. You know what I'm saying? Like yes, when he does hit the ball, when he does make contact, he usually hits it pretty hard. Um, I could see him taking a step forward next season. And like I said, he does have that 30 stolen base potential with 
honestly 30 home run potential on like a 99th like, percentile outcome but like he has it he has that he potential. has it agree and that's why he's ranked number 11 here because the the power potential the speed potential is is 30 30 and you're not really going to find that at this position i mean i'm even looking at our top 10 right now you will not find that at our, at this position outside of maybe the number one guy so you're right you know but also me personally, I don't know where I'm drafting Jazz Chisholm because I don't know how many runs he's going to score in that Miami offense. I don't know how many RBIs he's going to drive in in that Miami offense. I don't know if the batting average, he's just got a lot of swing and miss in his game. And I think he's going to sell out for a bit more power because I think we've heard too, he wants to be the 30 30 guy. Like that's, you know, we've heard that from Arm even say that before. Yeah. Like he wants to be the 30 30 guy. And I think he's totally okay hitting 240. That's why I'm a little bit nervous. And if Miami doesn't add big bats after the lockout ends, we could see a barren so Miami lineup. I think they're going to, too. And that's why I'm confident in Jazz Chisholm. And that's why I think the RBIs and the runs could tick up a little bit. Yeah. I just feel like I feel like we kind of know what Jazz Chisholm wants to do. And what I think he wants to do is hit the ball in the air and steal more bases. And I don't know if he cares about the single to left field. Which you know is fine. I think it's great. okay. I'll take 240 with 30 30 all day. Yeah, I mean, that, but that's um, 99th percentile. Most likely, yeah. I think the 30 25, stolen bases, 25, though, is like. Is not out of the realm of possibility. Right there. Like, I, I would say right he's, for him. but wouldn't you say, I think he's more likely to steal 30 bases than hit 30 home runs. Yeah, by far, by far. And I think that the speed is where you're getting the great positive kind of, for that's sure. a baseline. Like, I think 20 stolen bases is a lock. I think the, the biggest hurdle to get over with Jazz Chisholm is is not actually the lineup concerns because I do think the Marlins are going to add after this deadline all the reports coming from Craig Mish. I mean, you just had him on the Just Baseball show, right? I think the reports from Mish are saying that they're going to go for a big bat after other after right. They already got Avisel Garcia. He's a he's a good piece in that lineup. I think the biggest risk here with with uh, Jazz Chisholm is injury because. He plays the game at such a intense level. Jose when, Reyes-esque. Right? When you're stealing that many bags and you're playing defense as hard as he does, you're going to put your body on the line. And it's not to say that he's going to be gone for the season if he gets banged up, but I think he's a guy that's going to miss a week here, a week there with like little things because he just plays the game at such an intense level. So let's wrap up. Um, when you're moving, when you're looking at 11 through 20, we do this at the end of each ranking. Who's a guy that you think could, has a potential to vault into the top 10? And who's a guy who you think maybe you're staying away from and has the opportunity to drop from the top 20? Brendan Rogers is the guy for me that I think can vault into the top 10. And I think a big part of that is just his average. It, it's so hard to find guys that have 300 potential in baseball these days. I mean, you look at these rankings top to bottom. How many of these guys hit 250? It, it's like 80% of these guys hit 250. I think the MLB average average was in the 230s. It was like 240 last year. So finding a guy that hits 300 is very, very rare. I think Brendan Rodgers does have the power potential to hit 25 home runs. If he hits 300 with 25 home runs, he's going to be close to a top 10 second base, second baseman and shortstop next season. Agree. I love that pick. I love that pick. The guy who I think could vault, um, that was kind of my pick. Um, but if I'm going to choose a different one, you know, there's not a ton of upside with the rest of the gang here. So I guess I'm kind of going to cheat a little bit. I think Jazz Chisholm has the upside to get into the top 10. We just yeah, talked I mean, about he, the power and the speed potential. <laughs> and I know he's number 11, but like, for example, there's just a lot of safe guys like DJ LeMahieu, Ty yeah. France, Jake Cronenworth. Um, and then I could say, I mean, you know, I don't think Lu Luis, Arias, Luis Arias has the chance to vault into the top 20. But that's the great part about second base is there's a lot of guys who know what they're going to do. But I would say if, and then if you put a gun in my head and you said, who's one guy that could fall out of the top 20, DJ LeMahieu. I mean, I, we think that he's going to have a bounce back and we believe it, but there's the other side that if he turns in something like he did in 2020, 2021, that he's not even close to the top 20. So there's, there's reasons to be slightly nervous about DJ LeMahieu, but I think 
if you get him a little bit later in the drafts and he turns right back into DJ LeMahieu, that's a phenomenal pick. So I don't really have a problem with any of these guys. Do you? I don't have a big problem. I think I'm just still on the the Tommy Edmond like hate train. I don't know why. I, that guy just like to me is not a leadoff hitter. He doesn't get on base and he hits 260 to 270. Like I don't know. I'm not a big Tommy Edmond fan, but in just, fantasy he he steals 30 bags. So I, I just think he's right. a better hitter than that. I think he's a better hitter than 260. Um, I just I like his I like his bat to ball skills and he's so fast. I think another year in that Cardinals lineup, I think we're going to see a higher batting average from Tommy Edmond. Before we wrap up, I do want to just like gum full circle here. Please, please, please write down Jose Miranda's name. Please. Like you're going to thank me later. If you write his name down 343 with 30 home runs last year in the minor leagues. And he is probably going to get 400 to 450 plate appearances in a twins lineup and get, he's going to have a lot of potential, write his so name down. Someone you absolutely have to watch. And the first base rankings are already up on justbaseball.com. And on Friday, of course, we will be ranking 10 to 1. Get your not gambling advice merch. Link is in our episode description. I'm rocking my shirt right now under the bomber because it's freezing in New York City. And, you know, when I turn my heater on, it just sounds like there's a there's just bombing going on in the middle of my heater. So I got to be freezing in my own room. But that'll do it for Wednesday's edition of Not Gambling Advice. Hopefully, when we talk to you on Friday, we have an actual deal on the lockout. But Colby and I, it's almost 5 p.m. Eastern. We got to go back. And with that, thank you, everybody. Bang.